So, yeah, welcome everyone to our talk today, which is uh, about monitoring of machine learning. So we are both from Zalando Payments, which is kind of a sub-company of Zalando. So I think people that live in Europe have heard of Zalando before. It's the biggest online fashion shop in Europe. Uh, and this talk, we want to give you a brief idea what we do in terms of data science there. And then we go over to this uh, main topic, which is why we should monitor pre uh, machine learning models. Then we, I will talk about a little bit about uh, prediction monitoring in general, and Laurent in the end will uh, give you some insights about our, our implementation of these topics. So, who we are and what we do. So, I'm Patrick, and here's Laurent, he will uh, catch up later. So, we both work as data scientists at Zalando. Uh, I'm there for three and a half years, Laurent is there for one and a half years. Yeah, and we have different backgrounds, maybe uh, basically in uh, data science, machine learning, computer science. So but maybe more interesting what we do at Zalando. So as I said before, Zalando is the biggest uh, fashion online shop in Europe. So maybe for people who didn't heard it before, it's like Amazon, but only in Europe and only for fashion, right? So. What happens typically in such an online shop, there are people, uh, they shop, they put items in the cart, they want to have this shirt and this pants, and then uh, we ship them the stuff, and then they pay. So we have a very special thing here in, in Germany, it's called invoice payment, so it's like uh, when you buy something, we would allow you not to pay immediately, but only after two weeks, right? So that's. Uh, some people not from Germany, they, they also they always think that's kind of weird, but it's actually what, what Germans love. They don't trust internet very much. They want to have something before they pay. So, but the problem with this approach is more or less that this could happen, right? So we would uh, ship stuff to the customers, but they will not pay. So this is uh, obviously not so attractive for Zalando to, to ship them something that they don't pay. So our job is kind of to prevent this, okay? So we are in the payment fraud department. Uh, I can give a little bit more detail throughout the, the course of this talk, but I will not talk uh, like in detail how we actually uh, exactly do this and how we prevent this payment fraud, but at least you can get an idea, I think. So what we do for this, we have a machine learning model, so we will like judge every order and will kind of try to estimate the probability if someone pays or not, right? Depending on this probability, if it's very high, probably we don't ship the order or have other measures in place. But the in interesting thing for you is like we have orders in the shop and for, order every, every, uh, for every order we have to attach this fraud probability. That's, that's the end of our story, that's what we do. Uh, and how we do this is we like have data lying on AWS 3, uh, AWS 3, yeah. And it's kind of a collection of all order data in Zalando. And it's quite a huge uh, big data set because Zalando is out there now for around 10 years. So we basically have access to all these orders and we can just check who paid in the past, who not. We try to build a machine learning model with Apache Spark on top which then uses stuff like logistic regression, random forest, GBT, neural networks, whatever. We have always tried to find new features, try to find new model to make this prediction more accurate. Okay, so it's a very classical uh, binary classification problem. You want to predict fraud, one, not fraud, zero. Uh, the thing we have to do, which goes a little bit beyond machine learning is that we also have to kind of supply our predictions in the production system. So uh, we actually want to evaluate the fraud risk for every order very timely. So other teams depend on it and we have to provide it within one second. So if someone orders, we have to say, yeah, fraudster, not fraudster. And for this, we also built a module, a REST service, which contains this module that I showed you just one slide before. So it basically is, fed by some features X, which are, of course, top secret, and it uh, puts out a fraud probability. 
So this REST service is run in uh, Scala Play. And since Spark is also in Scala, you know, we can just load there the models and do the prediction. So yeah, I think that's, that's what you need to know about this slide. Uh, in general, what we use in our team is quite yeah, diverse. So if, if we interview people, it's kind of always difficult to, to like ensure that they have heard of this stuff, but we actually cannot like, uh, uh, we cannot have find people who know all of this, but probably we'll ask for people know Scala because we write machine learning code in Scala, and of course they should know machine learning, but on top of this, you know, we use all this other stuff like Amazon AWS for deploying stuff, Jenkins for production stuff, Spark is where we import in our setup, and if we do experimentation, we rely on R or Python, so whatever the data science people prefer. Uh, so this was this introduction round, so now we come to the topic, why we should monitor. And I uh, will first give you some rather abstract example, which could happen like this in an online shop, but it's not very attached to what we do. But uh, it could be that you are working in such a data science team in an online shop, and uh, there's someone coming to you and say, ah, yeah, deploy a model for fraud detection in online shop. So you should basically build this binary classification model that I just described and deploy it to production. So that's different steps you have to do, obviously. So the first one is you have to somehow collect the training data. You have then to train a model, and finally you deploy it to production. So let's look at these steps individually. So at least what we do, we kind of collect our data, training data uh, in one central store, which is Amazon S3. So not sure, I guess most of you know what it is. It's like a, on a big key value store, which is very cheap and you could just put a lot of data there. So if you have then this online shop like Zalando, you would uh, run around through all the systems because you need features from everywhere. And some of this data may be only accessible in logs because some, some other team had a live system which produces these logs but doesn't write it to database. So you have to fetch these logs. If you are a little bit more fortunate, it may be in a database where you can just crawl this database or even a data warehouse. So, but actually what I really recommend is that you collect this kind, kind of proactively because what we had in the initial stage is every time we learned the model, we went just before learning to all the systems and try to extract the data, but this did not really work well because the database is a live database, right? So you should not collect during business, uh, high, peak business time their data and the log data uh, is maybe also not available. So what we do, we collect it offline during the night for every day and put it to S3. Good, then you have some kind of Dating, training data sets, so or you have to be, if you have smart data scientists, they will come up with features which would kind of indicate if this is fraud or not. So one thing probably could be that someone who is a fraudster has some kind of a bot running who does all the orders for you, right? So uh, maybe one good feature is the time to order. So what is put here is just the time in seconds when someone comes to your homepage and then the time until orders. And if what in this example here, I have several cases where there are like all these secret features and we, we use, but one of them is time to order. And you see like there's a fraud case here and it was only five seconds. So maybe it was a bot because no one could probably order in five seconds. Uh, and most, no, most of the not fraud cases are around between 120 and 300 but there's also one fraud case for 250. So maybe this is a good feature or not. But uh, just remember there is this kind of time to order feature, maybe helpful for our model. So if we look now at this feature and we would just plot some kind of a histogram or a kind of a empirical distribution of it, yeah, we would see if we just put plot this here with bars, then it would be somehow normal distributed around 200 seconds. Okay, uh, I mean, sounds reasonable, right? So maybe most of the people use actually this time. Uh, 
when we now go live, there, at least probably in most cases, there will be another service which feeds you these features because you are kind of a machine learning data science team and all this stuff that we collected before offline for training needs to be available live really fast. So probably there's other team who sends you just exactly this data and then you just have to product and put out this P fraud. So that's how it works in our case. And uh, once we're live, we get features X sent over by different microservices in real time. So, uh, and mostly this team probably is uh, built by, this service is built by smart software engineers, smart big data engineers, but not part of your team. So now we come to this monitoring part. So you deploy this new model and X come in, P4 goes out. And now we, we all know microservices, you have to monitor, right? You have to look at stuff like CPU usage, memory usage, latency, all this kind of classical stuff from the software engineering world. And if we say, this is all cool, then probably this thing works. Okay, but that's only uh, one part of the story, at least if you have a machine learning model, because then this could happen. So some weeks later, people are angry and <laughs> they say, tell you that they, you did not detect the fraud and the business is ruined, okay? so. Maybe one point about this, what we have, especially in our domain, if we want to take payment fraud, and there is, uh, as I told you earlier, there's this, like, this delay, so people have two weeks' time to pay or not, they kind of, uh, you only will detect if they paid after two weeks, right? So if, you're, if something goes wrong in your model and it's producing now crappy predictions, you will find out two weeks later if you have the labels, right? And in this time, your business could be ruined. So this is the problem we kind of want to tackle and now you start investigation because this business guy just comes to you and says something is really wrong, look at your system and then you maybe do the same thing again that we just did and you say, huh, looks fine, I don't know what happened. But now comes this part where you not only look at this, this classical stuff but you also could look at X and now we look at X and we now see these values, right? <laughs> and they are kind of different to what we saw in the training data. And all, if we plot them now in this empirical distribution, you also see like there's a different number, which is now 200,000. So what happened? The mean shifted from 200 to 200,000. And then you go probably to this team who built this microservice feeding your prediction system. And then you find out that the feature is not sent to us in, millisec uh, in seconds, but in milliseconds, right? So I think this, <laughs> this is not really, did not really happen so far in our team, but I think it could happen because, you know, data scientists, they maybe think in seconds. Engineer, they, they, everything is milliseconds, right? But the obvious thing is now, if this feature tells you that, then all these uh, predictions that you produced are garbage or could be garbage if this feature is super important because now our model is like very sensitive to detect uh, bots by saying if the small, the time to order is very small, then it's probably a fraud so, but it now gets feed all these values. It will just say, ah, no bot will like take like 300,000 seconds to order anything, right? Maybe it's very uh, undecided customer who spends a lot of time on our homepage. So the, uh, the key point is here, this is not good. So there are several problems. We lost, uh, we lost a lot of money and we did not detect it in time and we could have detected it in time and provided a fix if we looked at this feature distribution much earlier, not only after two weeks. So the conclusion of this is that we need to make sure the distributions of input features are always the same as in the training data because we train our model on uh, data with certain distributions and we only can rely on these predictions that they're really doing what we want if they would be same, the same kind of data also in production. And this brings me now to prediction monitoring. So I will like now give a rough overview and then uh, in the second part, Laurent will tell you some implementation details how we did it. So the first thing we want to monitor is uh, failing features. So consider that 
once you have this feature, time to, uh, sh time to order, this could also be null a lot of times. So we are living uh, like in an uncertain world, and this team that could collect these features and send it over to you, they could also just put a null in this field. And what would you do in your model? You can not predict on a data point where there is a null. So what is typically done, you do some kind of imputation, right? So you take some kind of the median or average that you saw on training data, but this will still kind of corrupt your prediction. So one very important thing in our world is to monitor how often a feature fails. And there is some kind of natural failing if it's only a few percent of predictions, but if you see this list, so if this time to prediction would be 90% null in all cases, then you should go to this team that sends you this over and should ask them why this is the case. Something, uh, now we come to the more elaborate thing is, what you really should do and would, what would have actually tackled this case I introduced earlier is if you compare the distributions of every feature between the test data and the live data. So this picture just, just show each small picture as a feature, and this is how it was distributed in test or training, and how is it distributed in live. So I put there test data because you could also do it on training, but typically test data is the data where you're very confident because it's where you generated this uh, performance measurements like area under rock curve and thing, and you want to uh, behave your model in life like you saw it when you measured it, right? Because this is where you said it's good. So you would compare it on the test data, and I have some one plot here which we actually generate, and you have the three things. So the red one is the live data, the blue one is the test data, and the green one is the train data. So now you see, like, actually in the live data, there are much more values of 0.9, say, or not. So, <laughs> but what does this picture tell us? Is this, is this still good or not? And the answer is that there is no easy answer for this, right? So what we kind of did is we uh, monitor continuously and we compare this distribution to each other. And there are like tons of uh, com uh, how do distribution comparisons in, in statistics. One of them is a KS uh, test, which kind of uh, compares the CDFs. Lauren will say more about it, but with this, with how we implement this, we can really say, okay, this feature was looking in tests like this, in life it's looking like this, and that's the difference. This number is the difference between this distribution. And if this is really high, then it's really bad. And uh, depending on your business, you have to define what is bad and what is good because there is no universal answer to this. So if, if somebody says, okay, well, feature three, it's a little bit different, but it's still okay, there is no like business effect we saw in the past did not really uh, suffer from this distribution, maybe it's just kind of seasonality, that's okay. But this is the thing, you have to threshold these values and then you have to find out your own what is acceptable and what not. And there are some uh, other things. So now imagine we have now the system which kind of compares in, in certain time frames the current feature distribution to the test. So they have kind of parameters you can tune and the first one is how big should be the size of your aggregation window, right? Because if you want to do, build this distribution plot, you have to window it somehow and count the number of occurrences. And one could be you take it very, very small one, then it means you only look at one last hour and compare this to the test distribution. The good thing is this is like you can detect anomalies very fast, but if you have seasonalities in the data, you know that people in an online shop behave differently in the morning than in the evening, then you would get a lot of false positive alarms. And maybe the other extreme, so it's you look at, you aggregate data from the live system over 12 hours, then you kind of aggregate out all this short-term seasonalities, at least during the day, but uh, you are slower of detecting anomalies because you know this, this sliding window, if there's an anomaly now, the sliding window will slide over it and only if this anomaly makes most of the window you will see like a difference or something. The same is uh, 
yeah, you, how often should you do this? And this is kind of, if we go live here and then you have this 12 hour window, you could maybe do this, you know, every hour you could look back on the last 12 hours. There's also a trade off for this. So the more often you do, the more, the quicker you can define, uh, com uh, detect anomalies. But it's very complex, you know, you have to, it, it costs money if you do it, at least on AWS, and uh, then you have to do it more often. So it's more complex, and it's uh, also kind of complex operation, or you do it less often, then you don't have to spend enough money, but maybe you also have this delay again. So actually, I think there are some approaches. I think there was a Twitter paper where you actually could really do this in kind of real time. So with every few data points, they will kind of detect this anomaly. But at least for our system, this kind of approach works very well. So we don't have to build a very complex system to master this. Okay, and this live monitoring last slide for me is why, why we do it and what we had in the past. So the number one thing is this technical problem. So the data that you get from other teams is just not the data that you saw during test. And this could be that they have a problem on their side collecting data, that they have different units, that they implemented maybe this data gathering uh, feature different than you. And for this, it's very uh, useful. Uh, since I'm kind of out of time, I will now give over to Laurent for the implementation part. Um, hi, we'll uh, continue with uh, going a bit more into detail of how we implemented the things that uh, Patrick uh, described you. Um, so um, we start with the central uh, problem of this presentation is how to uh, measure the difference between two distributions automatically. So um, in this picture, we have two distribution represented as their uh, probability density functions or histograms. Um, so we have the one which, uh, which is a blue and the yellow one. So the blue one has a peak around the middle and the, the yellow one has two peaks, one, one to the left and one to the right. So looking at this visually, you can uh, see that it's uh, quite different. But uh, doing something very simplistic like just taking the average, um, the averages would probably be quite close to each other. So we define this... Uh, uh, distance measure between uh, the distributions, which is uh, just uh, two integrals. So the, the denominator, the normalizing factor is just the area of everything, like uh, this uh, overlapped uh, distributions. And um, the, the numerator is the, the area of the parts which, which uh, differ. So um, in practice, we don't compute these integrals. We just take sample points and we measure how big they are. Like for instance, there, uh, there is an example of one, one, uh, one difference and then we sum them up and normalize them to be between zero and one. So if two distributions are completely identical, then the distance will be zero. If they are completely different, the uh, distance will be one. Um, so we do it like this, except that we, in, uh, we actually don't keep track of the, of the histograms, but we use the uh, cumulative distribution functions. So this is not a problem because cumulative distribution functions and probability density functions are kind of equivalent. You can go from one to the other by differentiation or integration. And the reason why we prefer uh, uh, cumulative distribution functions is that if um, uh, you have the histogram and um, uh, the most common implementation of histogram is, is that you would take the minimum and the maximum value that you see and then chop, chop up the space into equal size buckets and then count how many things are there. So if the maximum is pretty far out on, uh, on, on, your, um, on your left, um, then then uh, most of the data will be just in, in one or two buckets and it will not be very good. So, so uh, the uh, cumulative distribution function gives us kind of percentiles. So what it, uh, what it tells us is that for a um, certain value, let's say zero, how many, how many of the values are smaller than it? So is here we see 
about 40% of values are smaller than zero, and we, we get this for every value. And conversely, we can see, okay, what is our uh, 60 percentile or 99 percentile and so on. So we can, can cut down like this some outliers. So um, the um, disadvantage of uh, uh, using percentiles is per that percentile is not so easy to compute like histogram. Um, but um, we uh, compute it, use it just approximate, uh, approximately um, uh, compute this percentile. And for this, we use a very useful technique that is called t-digest. So um, I have put uh, here some uh, Scala code just to show how easy it is to do this. So first we just uh, import that, uh, that library. And uh, then here we have two functions, both uh, create. And um, the first one can create a t-digest, which is a summary of a, of a cumulative distribution function. And it creates it from an in-memory collection. So we just get these numbers, which is sequence of doubles. And then we just uh, create a t-digest, and, and uh, we just add each of the numbers there. And we, uh, we have the, we have the t-digest, uh, basically. And from here, we can get percentiles and, and such. And, um, if the data is really big, then we can uh, uh, store it as a distributed collection, for instance, in Spark. So we have this RDD of double, and this is not much more complicated than, than this. Uh, the RDD will, be, will have several partitions, and for each partition, we basically do this, and then we have a lot of different t-digests. So this happens in this sequential operator. And um, uh, then we, we have a, a, a t-digest for every partition. And t-digest has a nice uh, uh, property that it can be combined. So all uh, t-digests of all partitions are combined to the final result in, um, in the combining operation. So um, now let's look into how the data is actually collected. So before, when we, see, when we saw how we, we measured uh, the distances, we assumed we just have these distributions. But these uh, um, um, values of these features are collected from, from production. So this is a schematic um, overview of how our uh, prediction service looks like. So we have a REST service. There is a prediction engine there. Uh, there are some uh, machine learning models which were trained previously and they are loaded from S3. So a request comes in, then a uh, prediction is made and uh, the answer is, uh, is sent out. So this is working very well and if we want to build this data collection on top of it, one thing we want to take care of is that we don't mess up this system very much. So we just uh, add um, some um, um, components to the, to the right. So we just add uh, an SQSQ and another process which collects uh, the data. So this, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is also called something like lumberjack pattern. So you log everything that you get into the system and that you respond. So you get log all of this, um, uh, your requests and the features that you have computed. And, and then you send, just send this off to an SQSQ. The, the reason is that uh, this is not a critical process. We are allowed to fail in uh, co uh, collecting some of the data points here, but we never want to be delayed or fail because this, uh, this go wrong, goes wrong. So we uh, move this uh, collection and saving of the data logic to a different service, to this uh, lumberjack uh, process. And um, uh, this... Um, um, Process of collecting uh, collecting the logs. Uh, here I I have uh, we have um, simplified the code a bit that it can fit to a slide. So by throwing away all the error handling and cleanup and other stuff, but uh, basically it's, uh, it still captures the the main uh, ideas. So um, uh, what we have here is a, a function. This is a Go code. So we have this SQS interface. Then we have a dump size, like how much, uh, how much uh, logs we want to uh, handle together. Then we have a channel with, on which uh, the process can be interrupted. And then we have a, like a callback function. Once we gathered enough logs, uh, this upload function will, will uh, do something with it, put it into a database or in S3 in our case. So we start to initialize these buffers and put a timeout. And then we have this infinite loop, which uh, reads on the interrupt channel. If in case it gets a message there, it has to stop. In case the time uh, 
a timeout happens, then also in that case we upload the data. Or otherwise we just read, receive new messages from, uh, from the queue, append it to the buffer, and when the buffer reaches a certain size, we just uh, um, upload the data. So what, what this upload function does in our case is just it creates a, a, a file and then it, it uploads it to, to S3. So um, uh, since uh, this uh, week the World Cup on football starts, uh, I will also mention that our systems uh, are called after football players and the name of this system is Platini. <laughs> so um, now uh, putting it uh, together in an AWS data pipeline. So the, the pipeline looks like this. So um, before this Lambda check process, collected all the logs and put them on S3. And then periodically we, we run these uh, jobs which do these aggregations over, uh, let's say, this 12-hour time window that Patrick showed before. So we take the logs and there's some Spark job which process these logs. It groups it by the models, so there are always several models uh, in production running. And then uh, failed features are computed, like how, what percentage of feature is failed. Then we create this T-digest and we create the histograms and then we, we measure the distances between the different features. And then we um, um, save this to, to a, like a common uh, uh, data format which can be used later to create some reports where you can look visually and compare uh, some, uh, some uh, distributions and look at some tables of uh, which features are, are missing. Or um, uh, more useful, we can directly do some alerts, uh, threshold some, something on the, on the distance and, and make alerts, because uh, usually there's no time to look at a lot of this, uh, a lot of this reports. So um, one um, uh, lesson that we also learned is that uh, it was not good to, uh, to make this uh, job create the reports or the alerts directly. Because the thing about reports is, is that when you look at them always, you want to change something and uh, measure something else and so on. So, so if we have an intermediate um, step, then uh, we can uh, easily just change the, re uh, the reports, how they look like, what they show and everything. Um, so the final notes, uh, if you have a, a machine learning system in production, you obviously have to monitor it somehow. And this monitoring is especially important if the, the performance feedback comes with a large delay, like in our case, because you cannot look just at, at uh, prediction performance and you have to find some ways of seeing if your uh, system doesn't work beforehand. Um, so the, usually th there is a lot of uh, research and a lot of uh, related work with, which have a very, very complex uh, way of uh, monitoring, but uh, uh, it's better to just start simple and try to not interfere with the production systems too much. And um, because it's no fun running this by hand all the time, it's better to automate as much as possible. And also, um, um, if... Um, there, there are start to come out some best practices around monitoring and if you want to measure how far you are, then I recommend to answer the questions in this uh, Google paper, what's your ML test score? So uh, although we worked on it quite, uh, uh, for quite a while, I think we're only about halfway through. So there's a lot more things to do. Um, so um, thank you very much. I'm happy that you came in such a large number and I hope it uh, is also useful for you. So uh, we are open to questions now or later in the coffee breaks. Thanks. Any questions? Hi, thank you very much. So I'm wondering, so I think it's great what you're doing and are you also taking um, initiatives to reduce this online, offline serving skew in the organization away. So because when I look at the slides, you had like the data team could access everything, like logs and the data warehouse and just grab features somewhere and all the other code to deploy the, uh, to develop the real-time features is scattered around the company. So are there efforts to solve the problem from the start and not from the end and looking what went wrong? You know what I mean? To like um, yeah. centralize something or have a data feature repository or something? 
Yeah, I think it's a difficult question. So it's uh, easy to, let's say, easier to find out the problem where, where it happens. But um, some uh, team that creates some, some data, uh, it's hard to, to um, uh, foresee every way it, it will be used. So maybe this code was written years ago and, and our team maybe didn't even exist then. So it's, it's hard to, uh, like in theory, this should be done, but uh, in practice it's quite hard to, to pull this off. So it's better to have um, each team, especially if, when they work autonomously, that each team monitor very well their system. And their, their use case is uh, monitored. So then hopefully all each, the, the whole is also working well, if the parts are working well. Yeah. OK, thank you. More questions? If not, uh, thank you very much for your presentation.